Just as any other country, Great Britain has its fair share of political intrigues, deals, negotiations and developments which, over the years, have frequently become the focus of multiple film and TV adaptations. One only has to look at TV shows like Yes Minister to understand how big of a cultural impact those types of fictionalized politics can achieve. Stephen Frears has created multiple acclaimed film and TV productions since the 1980s in the fictional politics genre. One of his more recent projects was the 2018 miniseries A Very English Scandal. Based on the 2016 book of the same name by John Preston, the series covers the events of the Jeremy Thorpe scandal which took place in the late 1970s. It addresses themes regarding sexuality, class and Britain's judicial system as it explores the different backgrounds of its various characters. The following video essay will give you a brief overview of the events as they took place between the 1960s and 70s in order to establish a better understanding of the show's plot. Then we will move on to a closer analysis of the series itself. We will take a detailed look at various production aspects such as directing, writing and casting. Especially important here will be the exploration of the show's mixing of genres and how it portrays its characters and the historical political circumstances they found themselves in. Does the show make an effort to address political issues that were important at the time, or are there also connections to more current events that could have been influential during the time of production? A very English scandal might be set in the past, but a closer analysis of the series could also reveal a better understanding of not only political developments of the past, but also how we have learned to deal with the consequences of said developments. Keep in mind that the following synopsis is only very brief and only tells you the basics so you will understand what I'm talking about later. So please still go ahead and watch the show or read the book because there's still many many more interesting and thrilling details to be discovered about this whole story. But for now, here is the Jeremy Thorpe scandal as it happened in very brief terms. In 1960, Jeremy Thorpe, an MP for the Liberal Party in the House of Commons, began a sexual relationship with the young Norman Josie. With homosexuality still being illegal at the time, they had to be extremely careful, especially Thorpe's political career could have been ruined beyond repair if the couple were discovered. However, after feeling increasingly uncomfortable in Thorpe's presence, Norman made the relationship public to a close friend and the police. However, the authorities did not believe him, even after seeing love letters written by Thorpe, and the whole matter turned quiet for a while. Over the next couple of years, Thorpe ascended the political career ladder while Norman worked in various jobs. Thorpe wanted to distance himself from the young man and ask his fellow politician Peter Bessel for advice. Over the next few years, Bessel would continuously take care of the now called Norman Scott, all the while Thorpe continued his political ascension, which eventually led him to becoming leader of the Liberal Party in 1967. But in 1968, Norman reappeared, and that was when Thorpe, now a married man and father to be, began to see him as a potential threat to his career. Inviting Bessel to his office, Thorpe said of Norman, Then what do we do? We get rid of him. There's only one thing we can do. Kill him. No, if only we could. No, I mean it. Unsure if Thorpe was serious, Bessel played along in a joking manner at first, but in 1969, the issue resurfaced and Thorpe once again let Bessel and mutual acquaintance David Holmes know that Norman would have to die. Bessel and Holmes hoped if they stalled, Thorpe would eventually forget about the whole affair. But Thorpe wanted the issue to be dealt with. David Holmes was put into contact with Andrew Newton, who was willing to take care of Norman. On the 24th of October 1975, Newton met up with Norman, pretending he was sent to protect him from a potential attack. An overly anxious Newton, however, ended up shooting Norman's dog and attempted to do the same with the young man, but the gun failed to fire, which led to Newton fleeing the scene. With severe allegations now threatening to expose him, Thorpe resigned as Liberal Party leader in 1976. An inquiry led to Thorpe and his co-conspirators being charged with conspiracy to murder. The trial began on the 8th of May 1979 under Judge Sir Joseph Cantley. The testimonies of Peter Bessel and Norman Scott were effectively undermined by Thorpe's lawyer, George Carman. In a risky move, it was decided not to call Thorpe as a witness so he would not be able to say anything that might incriminate him. Judge Cantley was notoriously biased during the trial, discrediting Norman's character and praising Thorpe's reputation, 
all the while proclaiming I'm not suggesting that you should not believe him. That is not for me. I'm not expressing any opinion. On the 22nd of June 1979, Jeremy Thorpe and his co-conspirators were acquitted on all charges. Thorpe would be free. His political career, however, was completely ruined. The Liberal politician died on the 4th of December 2014 following his battle with Parkinson's disease. Norman Scott disappeared into obscurity but is still alive and now lives in Devon. In May 2016, John Preston's A Very English Scandal was being praised as probably the most forensic, elegantly written and compelling account of one of the 20th century greatest political scandals. Only a year later, the BBC announced a three-part miniseries that would be based on Preston's book. Stephen Frears was set to direct, while Russell T. Davis would be the writer. Even the casting of Hugh Grant as Jeremy Thorpe was already known at the time of announcement. All in all, a rather well-to-do group of faces that are all more than familiar to the avid viewer of British TV and film. Stephen Frears was involved in the creation of multiple productions which addressed British politics, such as The Deal and The Queen. He's also not unfamiliar with the art of adaptation, with works like Dangerous Liaisons and Philomena, all being based on previous existing works of literature. Since his depictions of political matters have been rather famous in the past, it would not be entirely uninteresting maybe to mention Freer's own political attitudes. The director is known to have voiced his support for the Labour Party, especially in an endorsement letter in 2019. Probably best known for being the first showrunner for the Doctor Who series when it was revived in 2005, Russell T. Davis has his fair share when it comes to creating popular television. The exploration of religion and sexuality are two major reoccurring topics in the writer's work. Queer as Folk depicts the life of gay men in Manchester, and the 2003 drama The Second Coming addresses religious aspects from a non-religious viewpoint. Being gay himself, it is not surprising how often Davis includes queer characters in his works. It is also not entirely atypical for Davies to mix the dramatic with the comedic, an essence he also brought to a very English scandal. Actor Ben Whishaw, who plays Norman, praised that aspect of Davies' writing, saying, It's brilliant when a piece of writing captures that quality, because it seems to me that's how life often feels. Even in the middle of something awful, you'll be laughing. That's a British thing. Hugh Grant might very well be the epitome of Englishness in the acting world. Especially known for his romantic comedy roles in films such as Notting Hill or Love Actually, the Londoner has become somewhat of an icon for the ideal love interest on the silver screen. Before A Very English Scandal, Grant and Frears had previously worked together on the film Florence Foster Jenkins. When Frears approached Grant to take a look at a miniseries he was working on, Grant was suspicious at first, saying, What's this nonsense? It's three scores of television and I don't do television. Freer's script, however, seemed to have that special something which would eventually draw Grant to the role of Jeremy Thorpe. Stephen Frears himself was very much aware of what type of person he was casting, even counting on Hugh Grant's distinct personality. Frears' explanation was simple. Well, he's a tough Hugh. You cast a tough to play a tough. For the uninitiated, tough is a rather British term that is used to refer to someone from the wealthy upper class in a more negative manner. However, there was still some concern from Hugh Grant's side when he was asked to play Jeremy Thorpe. The liberal politician was in his early 30s when he met Norman. Grant was 57 when he was set to play him. I had a long panic about it and thought I was too old, the actor said, but he was talked out of his worries by Frears. In the end, all turned out well for Hugh Grant, whose performance as Jeremy Thorpe was critically acclaimed. If one were to hear the story of a very English scandal for the first time, it would only be understandable if one were to think this to be a rather serious show featuring thrill and drama. And while this is not entirely wrong, a very English scandal also contains a surprising amount of humour and satire. Lisbeth van Zoon and Dominic Ring talked about the three distinct genres of comedy, thriller and drama when it comes to politics and fiction, almost all of which are mixed together in this 2018 miniseries. Comedy is firmly embedded in the British media culture and often serves as a vehicle for the dissemination and reflection of cultural values. The Thorpe scandal already became the target of humour back in the day when the judges' notoriously biased statements were widely mocked. As we consider Mr. Besson's evidence, he told us that he was a Christian. 
at the same time being sexually promiscuous. Therefore, he is a humbug. We have heard, for example, from Mr. Bix Bissell, a man who, by his own admission, is a liar, a humbug, a hypocrite, a vagabond, a loathsome spotted reptile, and a self-confessed chicken strangler. <laughs> the setting and characters of A Very English Scandal lend themselves wonderfully to political satire. Most of the main characters are politicians from the rich upper class and Oxbridge type, a social sphere many people would find unrelatable. This is why the world of politics is easily ridiculed as we have little direct commitment to it, making the stories surrounding Jeremy Thorpe an easy target for humorous exploration. While the show does not shy away from more classic situation of comedy, for example, when Bessel and Holmes talk about their plan to kill Norman, only for them to suddenly end up proclaiming it is a ridiculous idea. We lure him there, shoot him dead, chuck him in the swamp. David, you don't really want to do this, do you? Oh my God, no. I'm so glad. Bloody hell. It's insane. It's bonkers, isn't it? It's bloody nuts. There are also comedic scenes with a different touch. Addressing topics that are considered taboo or inappropriate is a well-known characteristic of English humour, and the time and place of a very English scandal make that all too clear. Especially moments involving the actions or talk about homosexual acts are frequently portrayed as humorous. The most famous or infamous example would probably be the scene when Thorpe enters Norman's bedroom and poignantly puts down a glass of Vaseline on the nightstand. Don't look so scared. Grant, who was a young adult at the time, also remembers society reacting in a rather comedic manner towards the Hall affair. We were always just sniggering, really. I think the Hall of Britain was sniggering. Even gay sex was a source of much greater sniggering than it would be now. This becomes evident during the courtroom scenes in the final episode, when the crowd loudly giggles whenever Norman describes any kind of sexual intercourse between himself and Thorpe. Could you identify it for the court? Vaseline. <laughs> and what was your reaction? I thought I was being sawn in half. <laughs> Here, Russell T. Davis's writing shows that his approach to the series was to try to encapsulate the nation's mood at the time the story broke. This also refers to society's understanding of the establishment and the common people. There is an undeniable sense of humour for the jury when Norman takes a stand. Absolutely not. All I wanted was my national insurance card. You went all the way to David Steele for a national insurance card. National insurance is my lifeblood. <laughs> Here the people laugh because they seem to be unable to imagine a life where someone would have to rely so strongly on such a trivial thing as national insurance. This serves as one of the more serious satirical moments, since it is meant to portray the general unfairness present during the trial, which is even emphasised further when, at the end, Thorpe is declared not guilty due to his social standing and connections. The comedy of A Very English Scandal stays away from the more classic sitcoms like Yes Minister, where politicians and civil servants are portrayed as dim-witted, lazy and uncooperative at best and as malign, manipulative and obsessed at worst and rather focuses on creating comedy through dialogue and realistic everyday humour. American journalist Rebecca Mead also points out the inherent Englishness of the series. Self-referential humour about the legacy of English television comedy and its evocation of the state of English culture and politics in the 1970s. As an example, she names the scene between Jeremy Thorpe and David Holmes, in which the latter explains he knows a man named John Le Miserere, Great name, you can really tell I love pronouncing this name, who is not the actor of the same name who was popular at the time. I can pay the money via Jean Le Missouri. That's it, we're done, we've bought his silence. Jean Le Missouri. Mm. Not the actor, obviously. Not the one from Dad's Army. Yes, obviously. Comedy remains a vital element of political storytelling on TV and can challenge us to find new modes of intervention which helps to develop a closer engagement with politics of all kind. 
While one could argue that the series dips into thriller territory with its murder and conspiracy storylines, the narrative usually stays clear of ever becoming too serious. Nevertheless, there is no question that a huge element of drama is an intrinsic part of the very English scandal. The series does not seek to explore an action-packed story, but rather chooses to follow its main characters, focusing on the human emotions involved in politics and the social and psychological relations between the main characters, as is typical for the genre. The series sticks to the more traditional form of realist drama, which is characterized by recognizable characters, cause and effect narratives, and a sense of real historical events. The production length of the show itself is rather typical too, especially when it comes to British TV. The entire show consists of three 60-minute episodes. The miniseries is a popular variation of the TV serial format and has become a staple of the contemporary British TV landscape. While a sex scandal involving a politician takes centre stage in the story, the actual politics Thorpe concerns himself with are only infrequently mentioned. The parliamentary business in the show is more of a backdrop for compelling emotions and conflicts rather than the driver of plots and developments. Fanzuna and Ring also point out that many political dramas are based on true events, or at least an articulation of real-life experience. TV dramas such as Our Friends in the North and The Project frequently make use of real-life events. The Very English Scandal goes even a step further and retells an entire true story surrounding actual politicians. Similar to films like The Deal, the miniseries dips its toe into docudrama, a genre which seeks to recreate and represent historical events and is produced in the manner of realist theatre or film. However, the dramatic license of the miniseries is greater than it would be for classic docudrama. While the series does cover a great number of events which truly occurred, there are also those moments when characters share rather private moments or proclaim their deep emotions. Scenes about Thorpe alone with Norman, or later his wives, add an emotional dramatic layer. However, those scenes also take away from the objective fidelity a docudrama would seek to uphold. As is conventional for television drama, the story contains a limited cast of characters and chooses to focus on a specific political figure and their environment. The main character in A Very English Scandal is unquestionably Jeremy Thorpe, alongside Norman as well. What is interesting here is that this seems to have been a more conscious decision from Davies and Frears, since Thorpe appears less often in Preston's original novel than one might think. The book gives a significant amount of attention to Peter Bessel, However, the miniseries minimizes his part significantly, and instead gives Thorpe more screen time in order to explore his character. A poignant example here would be the moment shortly before the verdict when we see Carmen and Thorpe sharing an intimate conversation. What a man with your power and privilege to choose him, I suppose, one could imagine. But Norman Scott was the best. Here, for one last time, after we see Thorpe cold and calculating throughout the entire affair, he gets the chance to show that he did indeed care for Norman. It is a rare moment of vulnerability for the politician, and in the end the viewer is left to wonder how Thorpe truly fell for Norman Scott. No such scene occurs in Preston's book, proving the series takes a special interest in focusing on Thorpe's character. When we meet the liberal politician for the first time, Preston describes Thorpe like this. While some of the older members found him brash and hot-headed, no one could doubt his appeal to voters. As well as being a bully and good-looking in a cadaverous sort of way, Thorpe had apparently bottomless reserve of charm. Thorpe was charismatic and sympathetic. The miniseries follows this description adequately. Thorpe makes easy and even humorous discussion with Peter Bessel, and shortly later we see him making flirtatious conversation with Norman. Thus, Thorpe is more of an untypical protagonist when it comes to TV politicians, who are usually plain men of uncertain age, around 40 or over, somewhat grumpy, somewhat clumsy, and hardly ever in full control of their situation. Thorpe's charismatic energy and Hugh Grant's physicality and repute certainly help to create a slightly more unconventional picture of the politician protagonist. However, what does remain typical for Thorpe is the development he goes through as the story unfolds. Nick Randall sees fictional politicians on a scale, which begins with those desperately trying to keep their heads above rapidly rising waters, it proceeds through degrees of ineptitude, and it terminates with accessories to murder. Thorpe's character descends from being an eccentric, charismatic politician to a man who refuses to acknowledge his sexuality and lover, and thus becomes a cold-faced man devoid of any initial charm. 
Jeremy Thorpe is portrayed as being a man who has two faces. The politician who speaks and smiles in public, and the closeted gay man who would rather die or murder than anything about him becoming public. I don't care what change they make to the law. If anything about me ever became public, I give you my word, Peter, I would put a gun to my head and blow my brains out. This becomes more and more evident throughout the series, especially when we follow Thorpe's political career. For the voters, he has to remain appealing. For the press invaders' privacy, Thorpe has to remain the unbothered politician who always has an answer for everything. Preston effectively describes the man's constructed character. The more successful Thorpe became, the more compulsively he would mimic people, taking on their mannerisms and cloaking himself in their characters. Even his public persona struck Bessel as being an exercise in mimicry. As the scandal unfolds, you can see Thorpe's public persona gradually becoming less and less trusting to the outside world. Randall argues that politicians are incapable of authentic action due to pressures originating elsewhere. The narrative shows us Thorpe's gradual descent into losing stability over his carefully constructed life. Even at the end, when he is cleared of all charges, he seems to know he has lost the public. I know you. Of course you're ruined. You know that, don't you? Oh. Very kind. When asked how he perceived Thorpe as a person, Hugh Grant said the politician was the last of the establishment. In a way, that's what the trial was. It was the turning point where the establishment fizzled out and new Britain started. Thorpe stands as the embodiment of how many, even now, perceive politicians to be upper class and disconnected from the people they represent. There is an air surrounding Thorpe's character which gives the viewer the impression the man believed he could get away with anything simply because he is a man of higher standing and great reputation. His more traditional character traits are juxtaposed with Norman Scott's more free-spirited and slightly erratic behaviour. Whereas Thorpe would never let anyone glance behind his mask, Norman loudly proclaims his life experiences. At the end of the first episode, Thorpe is confronted with this exact realization. Anyone who tells the truth and doesn't care. No one else does that, Jeremy. No one, certainly not us. In this whole land, there is Norman, and Norman alone. A similar but much stronger sentiment develops within Thorpe as he tries to get the affair under control. He's used to the old ways of governing and policing, thinking the whole matter can be discreetly swept under the rug. But evidence goes missing all the time. Policemen lie. Why can't this stuff just disappear? Why is everyone suddenly so bloody honest? I just... What we see in Jeremy Thorpe is the fading image of a politician who is stuck in the traditions of the past and due to society and his own unwillingness to change was doomed to drift into obscurity. The amount of actual politics portrayed within the miniseries is surprisingly limited. Despite one of the main characters being the leader of the Liberal Party, the series only concerns itself with a small glance at Jeremy Thorpe's role as a politician. This is not entirely uncommon for fictional narratives about politics. Instead of fixing its narrative gaze on the governing process, the Palace of Westminster typically serves as a set and as a backdrop rather than as a substantive political institution. Nevertheless, that is not to say that we do not see any politics. There are a few but very poignant scenes in Parliament depicted throughout the series, and naturally, the issue of homosexuality and its legality are discussed as well. In 1965, Jeremy Thorpe addresses his fellow MPs in regards to the UK's immigration politics. It is my duty to inform the Prime Minister that if he continues to restrict immigration, he is staunching the lifeblood of this country. And, and fueling the rise of the Keep Britain White campaign. Citizens from all over the Commonwealth deserve a free and safe right of entry, or else the government may find that its white paper is very aptly made. This short speech likely refers to the events of summer 1965, when Harold Wilson's Labour government published a radically restrictive white paper on immigration from the British Commonwealth that shocked even cabinet ministers. What we see here is the first of several references regarding political issues that were also concerning the UK at the time the miniseries was being made. Ever since the European migrant crisis of 2015, Britain has dealt with an increasing amount of discussion about its handling of immigrants. 
so much so that it would become one of the leading issues in the Brexit referendum, which at the end led one third, saying the main reason was that leaving offered the best chance for the UK to regain control over immigration and its own borders. What the very English scandal does is using Thorpe's supporting opinion of refugees in order to give the viewer a similar positive sentiment regarding an important current issue in British society. In the very same episode, we see Thorpe yet again addressing Parliament. This time, however, he's making a direct statement about Britain's relationship with Europe. This country's application to join the common market represents a huge opportunity for growth and investment, and not just for the bankers and businessmen in London. They have lined their pockets now. For my constituents in North Devon, and for all the good and honest workers across the land, Europe represents a bold new horizon, an undertaking from which we may profit and learn and enrich our lives for generations to come. This almost serves as a cheeky callback to 1961, when Britain first decided to apply to join the EEC, the prototype of the EU. One might call this short speech practically blatant in its intended message for the audience. When a very English scandal aired, the UK was in the middle of Brexit negotiations, having to figure out how it would want to stay connected with the European continent, especially regarding commerce and the economy. It is as if Thorpe is trying to tell the audience they should not disregard the EU, and that Britain's relationship with the continent is one worth keeping. In Preston's book, the seventh chapter, This Filthy Subject, begins the exploration of the process of how Leo Abzi, a Labour MP, and the Earl of Arran fought for the rights of gay people by wanting to make homosexuality legal. In the miniseries, this debate is condensed to a five minute long discussion in the very first episode. However, that is not to say that the issue is entirely written off. As already addressed in Thorpe's characterization, the man is somewhat in denial of his own queerness. He and Norman stand at complete opposite poles when it comes to accepting oneself as is. Thorpe is simply a product of his time. He doesn't even seem to realize that he has internalized the homophobia of the society he lives in. When asked if he was ever in love with Norman, for example, he says, Federer, that doesn't even exist. At the same time, Thorpe naturally agrees to support Abzi's bill to legalize gay relationships. However, one is tempted to think he agrees out of convenience for himself and not for the sake of freedom. In Thorpe's time, the decriminalization of homosexuality relied on a notion of negative freedom, that is, on the state's inability to interfere in the private lives of citizens, rather than on the recognition of the human worth of queer lives or loves, a notion which is displayed even by Thorpe himself. And those men will be free to be pitied, that's all. I don't care what change they make to the law. Within this statement, he distances himself from the rest of the queer community, as if he, in his standing as an upper-class politician, was not part of that very group. Despite the show's shortening of Preston's narrative, the show does take a moment to emphasize the emotional heaviness that was underlying the discussion at the time. In a series of flashbacks, the viewer is shown how Abzi struggles to find supporters for his bill, but eventually connects with Lord Aaron. As is common for the miniseries, there are moments of silly comedy in regards to Aaron's house being infested with badgers and him being a rather unconventional lord in general. However, there is a quick shift in tone. Whereas Preston deals with this in one sentence, the miniseries goes out of its way to have Lord Aaron emotionally explain his reasons for supporting the gay community. My brother, and the deaths go on by hanging, by poison, by gas, men killing themselves through fear and shame. In a clear and passionate statement, Lord Aaron clarifies that being gay is not an illness, but that society treats it like one and thus forces gay men into hating themselves. I think it's murder. They are murdered by the laws of the land, and I think it's time it stopped. It is one of the few genuine, emotional and outright sad moments in the very English scandal, emphasising the issue's importance. When we follow the trial in episode 3, Norman is the one who makes everyone in the courtroom aware of the fact that, while homosexuality is finally legal, the persecution of gay people has not stopped. 
But I do care how men like me are shoved into corners and masturbated in the dark and then thrown out the door like we're dirt. Like we're nothing, like we don't exist, and all the history books get written with men like me missing. Once again, this is a scene which does not exist in Preston's novel. Davies takes a dramatic license to present the viewer a passionate proclamation of a gay man, played by a gay actor no less, who expresses his frustration about how society treats him. It is no secret that homosexuality has long been missing in the medial representation, and only in the past 20 years have depictions become more frequently and increasingly more positive. Nevertheless, there might be a good reason why Davies chose to put such an emotional emphasis on the issue. In the UK, hate crimes against queer people have increased over the past few years. The rate of LGBT hate crime per capita rose by 144% between 2013 and 2018. So it is unsurprising that a gay writer known for addressing sexuality in his work would want to readdress the UK's treatment of its queer community. In Jeremy Thorpe, the audience are presented with a man who embodies what could happen if society is unaccepting and furthers a feeling of self-loathing. While as a Norman, we see the outspoken gay man who refuses to be silenced and encourages the viewer to take a closer look at Britain's treatment of minorities. A Very English Scandal is a short but poignant drama which seeks to address an old affair and current political issues at the same time. Using a surprising amount of comedy and satire, Russell T. Davis manages to paint the picture of a society lost in its own traditions. Jeremy Thorpe is a leftover of the establishment, of the old type of politician who thought they could even get away with murder. He is a slightly atypical protagonist in regards to the genre, however, that does not mean he is unfit as a main character. The series explores his personality thoroughly, wanting to discover the politician himself rather than his actual politics. A very English scandal feels like a very personal drama, one that shows us how people lived and also struggled in the not too distant past. The show cleverly sneaks in some commentary regarding current political issues in the UK, while at the same time remaining true to the events of its original setting. The miniseries unearths the continuing important debate of how powerful the establishment is, and that politicians, or rather anyone, no matter their social standing, are just as equal in front of the law as everyone else. Hello everyone, John here. Thanks for watching my new video essay. This time something slightly different because I really do love this mini-series a lot and got a chance to actually talk about it in a class for university uh, last semester, which is how this uh, essay was uh, made in the first place. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done it already. Go watch the mini-series or read the book, of course. And I hope I'll see all of you very soon. Goodbye.